Tom Campbell here. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our Patreon account or through a one-time donation. The links are in the description below. Thank you and enjoy the video. Tom, we have a question from Ingo on laser beam metaphor for emotions. Can the metaphor we use for healing also be used to handle negative emotions? I read a book about psychotherapy and it describes a therapy method where people should visualize their feeling. They should ask themselves, how does this feeling look like? And someone who had a fear of elevators may visualize a blue elevator and then they work with this image in the therapy. If you have visualized a feeling in that way, could you also use the laser beam or vacuum cleaner method to get rid or reduce the intensity of this visualized feeling? Or is this, a, or is this a method to avoid having to deal with an uncomfortable feeling? Well, the answer of that is yes, indeed. You could use that laser beam or vacuum cleaner or whatever other metaphor that, uh, that you uh, might come up with to get rid of or reduce the intensity of that feeling. Yes, that would work. Indeed. And I suspect that the therapist probably uses that. It probably is creating this, uh, you know, blue elevator or whatever in order to get a person to actually deal with the problem. See an elevator, see it in a, in a sense that it's not uh, a threat and that sort of thing. So my guess is that's really what the therapist is doing, but just not in a direct method. It's probably a, a much more roundabout method that is that is getting to it. But yes, you could use those same sort of things. This is a problem and you can work on it by having an intention to get rid of it because that intention modifies future probability and it, the future would be, a, would be more probable that you would have a lesser fear. And as you keep doing that, the future probability would be that you would have a lesser fear until you indeed do have a lesser fear. So yes, those things would, uh, those things would work. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a second question. Um, I was not quite sure about this question, but I hope it will be helpful for some people. Um, in the last weeks, I have observe people who do uh, private research on certain topics and they may discover something and want to tell others about it because they think it is important and maybe it is really important and then they realize that other people are not interested and that it isn't easy to talk about their findings this frustrates frustrates these people who want to share their opinion with others. Um, when you developed your MBT theory, um, it was probably not easy to talk about it with others either. Um, what would you advise others who are in the situation that they have problem communicating something and don't know how to do it? Well, that's true. When I was developing MBT, when I was going out to Bob and Rose lab, uh, um, after I'd written MBT and had books out, you know, it wasn't something that I really had a need to tell to others in a, in a sense of the people that I meet or the people in my daily life or the people at work that I worked with. Um, you have to understand that some people are ready for this information. Well, I understood that people, some people were ready and some people weren't. And the people who weren't ready, trying to give that information to them anyway, or to make them ready, just doesn't work. When they're not ready, they're not ready. They're not going to see it. It's not going to compute for them. And it isn't helpful. In fact, it just pushes them farther away into not being ready. Because they you know, they take whatever their beliefs are and their fears are, and they, you know, that becomes a firmer place for them to stand in as they reject your ideas 
as being implausible or, or whatever. So you're not helping those people by communicating to them. So then you decide that, well, that's good. You don't want to hurt people or you don't want to push people. And you don't want to push people back into their own beliefs and make them make those beliefs stronger. So you just look for people who are ready and who are interested. Now, that's kind of hard to tell. You can maybe broach a subject just very mildly or very gently and see if people take that bait and want to know more or are interested in it. And if they are, then you can maybe let another idea out and see whether they're still interested in that and probe it until you find, and if you find somebody who's really, really interested, well, then you can just talk to them. And now you've found somebody who is ready. But if you take that through two or three steps and then you find you hit a wall, well, they were interested sort of this way and that, but you know, they're not going any further. Then you just leave it alone. So you have no, I had no need to talk to people who weren't ready to listen and, and uh, weren't ready to have a discussion about it. When I put my books out, you know, I thought about, well, how do I market these books? You know, what do I do? Where's my audience? How do I, how do I tell my audience that these books exist? And I decided that there really wasn't any way to do that. So I just put them out on a website and left them there. I didn't really do any marketing. I just put them out there and said, well, somebody will run into them by accident. And if they, and if they uh, like it and think it's really good, they'll tell somebody else. And that's the way it's going to have to start. So I just put the website out there, and sure enough, people ran into it by accident. Not very many. I was only selling probably, you know, three books a month, <laughs> something like that in the beginning. Maybe in a month I'd sell three books. Maybe in a month I wouldn't sell any books. Maybe in a month I'd sell five books. But it wasn't very many. It was a very, very small trickle. But the people who liked it really liked it and got something really good out of it, and they told people. And eventually, now I sell about uh, 200 books a month. It's about kind of typical for me. And that's been kind of steady now for a lot of years. It's about 200 books a month is the people who uh, end up you know, getting books. So I think you just have to to... to let go the idea that, oh, these are my friends. I'd like to talk to them about it. Well, you'll have to just keep them as friends without sharing that part of yourself. And that'll just be the limitation of that friendship is you won't be able to go but so deep. Or in general, you know, that's just the way it is. So you have, you have, you have relationships with people on all levels. Some, it's just business, and mostly that's at work. When you go to work, you have relationships with all kinds of people, and you never really know who they are inside because all you see is their work face, and all they see is your work face. And you work with them, and you cooperate with them, and you know how many children they have, and you know what their names are, and you chat about their dog and their cat, and that's the level at which you know them. It's very superficial. You don't know them at deeper levels, and that's the way it is at work. And then you have other friends that maybe are at work or maybe not at work, neighbors, other people, and then you know them to a certain. So that all of your relationships can develop to the extent that they can develop. And then they can't develop much further than that. Or at work, you really don't want them to develop much further than that. You don't want to know them at that level of detail at work because it would get in the way of work. You know, you might really like or really dislike, you know, who they are at a deeper level, and that would get in the way of work. So you just know them superficially, and that's the way it ought to be at work. That's good enough. So think of all your relationships as they have a lot of potential, but some of them can only develop so much of that potential, and then they stop. So here's people, and I talk to these people about everything and anything. They're interested in, in this, all the things I'm interested in, and they care as much as I do about them, and that's great. And then there's other people that you just talk about the weather and, you know, everybody's health and 
all the current events and what's going on in the news, and that's as deep as it gets. So all those kinds of relationships are valuable, and they're all valuable for different reasons. And the people that you can really, really talk to and get down to, you know, the really most meaningful things in your life, those tend to be few. There's not a lot of those. And the people that you can talk about the weather, well, that's almost everybody. But you should, you should have, you know, relationships at all various levels. And it's okay. So I think the problem is when you have somebody that you like, and maybe they're a friend of yours, maybe even your best friend, but you can't talk to them about this, because this is something they just can't process. Well, you need to realize that that's just the limitation of that relationship. And all relationships will have a limitation somewhere, probably. The ones that have no limitations at all are very few and far between. But you'll have some of those. And, you know, you can go find people who you can talk to about the things you want to talk to. They exist someplace, too. And they're also frustrated because they can't talk to most of their friends about it either. So then you go to forums, you go to places, you know, you come to the fireside chat or you go to uh, other places where these items are discussed. And that's, that's your place for discussing these items. And maybe then it's just discussing these items and you never actually talk to these people about their cat or their dog or the weather or anything else. You know, they're just people you discuss this with. Well, that's okay too. That's the limits of that relationship. It's entirely uh, on, a, on a chat someplace or it's entirely by typing, you know, so you don't go into a lot of extraneous details. So you don't really know them that closely, but you exchange ideas with them. So let your friends and your relationships all be whatever they are, whatever they can be, and be good with that. Be happy with that. So does that answer your question? Um, yes. You mean you can push it on, on other people. And um, I know some, some people who have maybe discovered something I won't um, They won't be general about this topic and um, they discovered something and they want to um, tell others about it because they think it is important, but they can. So it's not possible to talk um, to another person um, and this, that frustrates these people. And that's the way I, I uh, that's why I asked this. Yeah, well, that is frustrating. You can't talk to everybody about everything and let the frustration go. Just realize that that's a fact. You can't talk to everybody about everything. Um, there's, you know, we talk about truth. And some people have this idea that you just need to share the truth. If it's the truth, then you just tell people. And you should always tell everybody whatever truth you have. And that's not the case. You tell people what they can, you can talk to people within the range of what they can process. And if your truth goes deeper than what they can process, then you don't tell them any more than what they can process. You let that go. You don't have to share everything with everybody. You shouldn't share everything with everybody. You share with those that, that can process what you want to share. And that should not be frustrating. It ought to be just an understanding that people have limits in what information they can process. And you just have to let them have those limits. Now, you may want to try to, you know, open that person up that they could talk about it, but some people you can't open up. They just run into a wall there. They have beliefs or ideas or their own personal knowledge that just won't go there. And then you just accept that and leave it. So it's the, the frustration is the problem. And the solution is don't be frustrated. Realize that's just, that's just life. It's the way it is. And, uh, You know, go go to places and to and to groups where you can share what you want to share. You know, and share it there. And don't be frustrated with people because they aren't the way you want them to be. People just are who they are. And you can't make them be the way you want them to be. You just have to let them be however they are and accept them and be friends with them right up to that level of interaction. And then 
that's as far as it goes. And don't be frustrated about that. Be happy about that because the parts you do share with them are good. The parts you can't share with them, you share someplace else. So accept it. Don't be frustrated. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Ingo. If no one else here present has another question, we have a unique opportunity to go on to the MBT forum questions. However, you take precedence if anyone has a new question. Giuseppe has a question. Please go ahead. Thank you, Tom. Donna. Hi, Tom. Hi, hi everyone. Mm -hmm. I have um, two questions. Um, one question is from the book because I got confused with something. I just read a sentence. Um, it says, your present personal um, your present personal identity will only persist as long as your oversold finds it profitable to man maintain it. I got a little bit confused because I thought I was an um, individuated unit of consciousness, but then the concept of the concept of oversoul appears, and now I don't know what I am. Am I a piece of, the, <laughs> of, piece of that? So I yeah. got a crisis, existential yeah. crisis. Yeah, I didn't know that I ever used the word oversoul in a book, but evidently I did, at least in the, in the copy that you're reading. Um, that's just another name for individuated unit of consciousness. It's just a, another name for it that other people use. It's the function they call oversoul, is, a, is, the, is the function in consciousness that accumulates all the various uh, experience packets, all the various incarnations. And that's the IUOC. So that's just, that's a name that Seth came up with. Seth and Seth, Seth Speaks by Jane Roberts. That was one of his terms for it. Um, when I looked at that function, um, you know, oversoul wasn't a term that I wanted to use because even just using the word soul, you know, makes it kind of religious in its connotation. And I wanted to keep it just a consciousness. So I must have slipped up on that one and used, used the, use that term because it's, it's, it's a synonym. So it is, it is exactly the same thing as an individuated unit of consciousness. Perfect. And then I'll pass on the second question. It's a bit personal in a way. I want your advice uh, and your wisdom because I, 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 I heard, I, I finished the book uh, sometimes and uh, I am trying with the meditation. I, I cannot be, um, I am not um, that disciplined person. I'm trying to work that thing out. Uh, I try to meditate most of the days. Um, some days I do it, some days I, I don't do it. But I feel a little bit frustrate, frustrated because, uh, I don't know, I, I, I use some of the techniques you said in the book. Sometimes I try to concentrate on the breath. But for me now, it's, it, it is hard to get to point consciousness, and I feel like I'm not advancing anything. Uh, and besides that, I'm trying, you know, to to become love, be part of the solution, etc. But uh, I am I'm a bit paralyzed with my meditation. I don't know if you got any advice on that. Yeah, well, prob your your problem, I think, is probably a fear, a fear that you are not good at it, a fear that you can't do it very well, a fear that you're not going to be successful, that you, you know, so you have some negative attitudes towards yourself as far as your ability to do this and do it well, as your ability to grow, you know, well, I can't concentrate and I can't focus that long and I'm not very disciplined and you go through all of these things, which are basically expressions of the fear of inadequacy, of not being able to do this very well. And of course, if that is your fear, then that's what you're going to create. You're going to create that situation where you're having problems with it and you can't focus and you seem to, you know, um, sometimes you'll do it and sometimes you won't. And look at your fear first. There's some negativity pointed at self, something about yourself that you're, that uh, where you feel inadequate, where you feel that uh, you're, you're, you're more likely to fail than you are to succeed. And deal with that fear. If you can deal with that fear and get that out of the way, then everything else in your life will get a whole lot easier. Not just meditating, but everything else in your life 
will get a whole lot easier if you can get rid of that fear. So that's something very basic that's getting in your way. And it's that fear that makes it hard for you to sit down and do it. You know, so you're thinking, well, I should go meditate now. And then you say, no, I just don't feel like it. I just can't do it now. I got to go take a walk. You know, I got to do this. I got to do that. Well, that's you sabotaging yourself. That's you sabotaging yourself so that sure enough, just like you fear, you're not doing it very well. It's just not working very well for you. So the problem is that you are sabotaging yourself on purpose to, I don't know, because you believe that that's the way you are, that you are inadequate and that you won't be able to do it very well. So it's that negative attitude is the problem. But if, you know, a negative attitude like that's not just a problem with meditation. That would be a problem with life. That's a problem with everything. You know, it's a problem with relationships. It's a problem with job. That's a problem with all kinds of things where, you know, that kind of keeps you off on a sideline, kind of keeps you, you know, not, uh, not in the winter circle because you don't see yourself as belonging in the winter circle. Well, all that is, all that just leads to where you sabotage yourself in order to make that come true. The fear creates what it fears. So that's the key thing. I mean, I could give you all kinds of other things about meditation and things to do it, don't do. But if you still have that fear, then you're still going to be in that same spot of, of, you know, getting in your own way and sabotaging yourself in, in doing it. So the other thing I could tell you about technique is don't worry so much about the technique. It's not so much about whether the breathing or the mantra or, you know, whatever else you're doing. The technique isn't that important. The idea is that you just let go of thoughts. Just empty your mind and don't have any thoughts. So the technique's pretty much irrelevant. They're just there to help you if you if you want them. You can just sit and do nothing and just put all the all the thoughts out of your mind. Have no thoughts at all. And just be there with yourself in, in that empty space. So don't get wound up with the with the technique because with your with your propensity to sabotage yourself, technique is where you'll do that. You'll say, well, I'm, I'm not, am I doing this technique right? Is my meditation the way it should be? Is my focus on breathing, oh, I forgot that breath, or is that working? And you'll get all wadded up in your inability to do the technique well, because that's what your fear is going to, to do. It's going to basically tell you that you're not doing the technique right. And then if you figure you're not doing the technique right, then, of course, it's not going to work. And you know, you're going to have that negative thing going on. So forget about the technique. That'll give your fear something less to grab hold of. And just let your mind be empty. Just sit, relax, think about nothing. And see how long you can think about nothing. And it'll probably be able to think about nothing for about three seconds. And then something will come into your mind. And when it comes into your mind, don't get upset. Just say, okay, that's a thought. Put it out. Now let's see how long I can think about nothing. And maybe another three seconds of thought will come in. That's perfectly normal. That's the way it works for almost everybody. But with practice, that three seconds will go to five seconds. And then it will eventually go to ten seconds. And you just keep doing that until you can do it for, you know, ten minutes. And if you can make it for ten minutes, that's good. Ten minutes is good. And eventually, maybe you make it for 20 minutes or 30 minutes, but you just keep working at it. So that's the thing you do is you just sit and don't think and don't worry about the technique because the technique is a is a place you can fail by not doing the technique right. And since your propensity is to fail, then the technique will get in your way. So without a technique, then the failure is that you can't, stop the thoughts from coming in, but of course you can, it's just slow. Yes, a few seconds you'll have a thought, and a few more you'll have a thought, but don't just say, ah, oh, I'm hopeless. See, that's the, that's the fear of failure, going to jump right in and claim failure and want to go on to go do something else. 
so you can claim failure at that something else that you're going to go do. So just keep at it. Make it. It may take you a month to get up to 10 seconds. Well, that's all right. If it takes you a month to get to 10 seconds, that's fine. It may take you another month to get to you know, 15 seconds. It may take you a year. It doesn't matter. You can do it. You just keep processing and working on it. And then you'll have your meditation. And then you'll have those little bits of seconds, those, those 15 seconds that you don't have any thoughts, and you're not aware of anything you know, physical, well, that's sort of point consciousness. You're not processing physical data. Because all that physical data comes in in terms of thoughts. Oh, there's my hand, it itches. Oh, I feel myself sitting in a seat, the cushion's kind of hard. It's all of those things. When you forget about all of that, you're not processing your data. So if you have only three seconds of point consciousness, that's all right. You know, like I say, and if it takes you months to get four seconds, that's okay too. Just keep working at it. And it'll get easier and easier the more you do it. And you'll succeed in spite of yourself telling you that you probably can't. But fundamentally, you need to work on the fear. Because that fear is affecting all the rest of your life, not just your meditation. And work on that fear and find, you don't actually have to find why you have it or where it came from. Sometimes people want to do that. They want to go back to the beginning. Where did that come from? Where is this feeling of inadequacy come from? And typically you find something in your childhood, something in your childhood where somebody made you feel inadequate. Somebody made you feel unloved, not good enough. And it probably is some trivial thing. And since then, you've maintained that feeling all these years, even though it was some trivial thing. And it wasn't about you at all. It was, it was about them, the way they were feeling, their issues, their problems. So it all turned out to be smoke. It's nothing, nothing real in there about it. But if you can't find source, that's okay. All you have to do is have that intent is, I don't want to feel that way. I see it in myself. And whenever I feel that, whenever I see that happening, where I'm thinking a negative thought, well, all right, I'll give this a try, but I probably won't do it very well. You know, you stop yourself and say, stop, I don't want to be that way. Not I don't want to act that way, but I don't want to be that way. And if you keep doing that, eventually you won't be that way. So you don't have to find the source. You just have to have an intent to change. Perfect. Thank you very much, Tony. It's, it's very useful what you said. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Abdul also has a question. Please go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering, Tom, so when you were younger and you found out about your abilities, um, how did your family members react? Maybe your parents, your uncles, aunts, when you disclosed it to them? So I was kind of wondering what happened. What, when I was having out of bodies? Is that what you said? Yeah, just when you closed it, how did your family members react to your abilities overall? Well, in general, my family didn't know anything about it. And I did have some instances where I mentioned something to my family. Um, I had a, an incident, I don't think I put it in the book, where when I was young, you know, less than 10, more like six, years old or so, I was going out of body and I slipped right out through the wall and I was outside and I noticed this truck. It was a white truck and it pulled up in front of the house and stopped and a guy got out and he had milk bottles in his hand and he came up to the porch and he put them, you know, I didn't see him when he went, when he went there, I was out in the river. Anyway, I could see that he was putting milk up on our porch and then he went back out into the truck and drove away. And I had no idea that's where milk came from. I knew that it appeared on the porch because I sometimes was given the job of going out and getting it out of the box and bringing it into the house. But I had no idea and I never thought about it. It just never occurred to me. Where does that come from? I guess six-year-olds, they don't think about things like that. And I hadn't. And then I suddenly realized it comes in a truck and gets delivered by some man. So I said something to my parents about it that the uh, 
that uh, I realized that the milk comes from a truck and a man delivers it to the porch. And they thought that I must have seen that looking out of a window. So they said something or other, and I said, no, you know, it wasn't out of a window. And I realized right away that they were not comprehending, and I just let it drop. And after that, I just didn't bother with things like that. I had the realization, you know, that was probably unusual for a six-year-old, but I had the realization that people just would not understand. And it wasn't something that, that people did very often. And I kind of got a sense of the uniqueness of it, and it was mine, and I had no need to share it. So my parents, my sister, my aunts and uncles had no idea that I was going out of body or that I was doing any other kinds of things in my mind. And I had, a, I had this idea when I was, I don't know, even seven or eight, that uh, I could use my intent to make things happen. And I would sit in the back of the car, and I would have a, try to make the traffic lights. My father was driving. I tried to make the traffic lights turn green just before we got to the traffic light. And I'd sit back there in my car, and I'd say, all right, turn green, turn green, turn green, you know. And I was working my intent on it and other things. I was working it on all kinds of things in my life. So I was practicing using my intent to modify future probability because somehow I knew that was something that would work. And I just knew it, but I never discussed it with anybody. I never told anybody about it. I never mentioned to my dad that that light's green because I made it green. I never said anything like that. I just always had the intuition that it was mine and it needed to just stay mine. So I don't know. Maybe I just was given that intuition or maybe it was because I already learned that lesson in previous lifetimes. But uh, so nobody, nobody knew. Um, when I, um, both of my parents were still living when I published my books, I gave him a copy of the books, but I don't think either one of them ever read it. So I don't think they really had any idea. I gave a copy of the book to my sister and I don't know if she read it or not, but probably not. So we never discussed it. If, you know, I always would let the other people start a conversation. If they don't want to ask a question or don't want to say anything about it, then I just let it go. I don't have any, I don't have any need to bring it up to them or to discuss it. So my family is mostly unaware of those sorts of things in my life. What about your kids? My kids? Oh, they were very much aware of it. I homeschooled my kids, and my big toe was on their reading list of uh, must-reads. So they knew all about that, and I talked with them about that. And uh, my girls, they had to struggle through the book. They just weren't all that interested. They were more interested in boys, not in books or in the nature of reality. They were more interested in boys. So they had to struggle, and... Uh, I'm not sure that they ever actually finished, although they told me that they did. They may or may not have, because that's just the way they were. Both my boys, one of them was, was uh, by the time I published that, one of them was uh, older. I have a son who is 50 years old, so uh, you can see he was, he, he was older when I was 50. And anyway... Um, my younger son, who was around the same age as the as the two as the two girls, he read it. He was very interested in it. He read it carefully, and he wanted to talk about it. And uh, he, you know, some place, some things he agreed with, and some things he didn't, and some things he wanted to argue with, and uh, some things he uh, he got uh, annoyed with. He got really, really annoyed with the idea that he says he understands that that. Uh, that he didn't know everything, but he really was annoyed with the idea that he couldn't know everything. That was something he had a hard time accepting. That was in that little piece of the book where I was talking about the intestinal bacteria, and there's just some way, you know, from your perspective, there's some things you just can't know. And uh, that, was the, that was the thing that uh, he liked the least in the book, that he just was, didn't want to come to the conclusion that he couldn't know everything. Well, of course, he was, what, 17 at the time or 16, 
and I suspect that was a was a viewpoint that's common with that age. That that's an age where they already think they know everything for the most part. So anyway, so my children uh, were aware of it, and my children have all come to at least one of my events, one of my talks that I've given. Uh, my son has come to one of the immersives where I talk about uh, where I teach how to do uh, remote viewing and healing and other paranormal things. Um, he's come, he has been to one of those. They have, they know that, uh, you know, I travel around the world and give talks and they're perfectly aware of all of that. And as young children, they were aware of my, uh, you know, uh, uh, mental acuity. They realize, you know, you can talk to my son and he'll tell you, you know, when he had something that he didn't want me to know, he'd have to, get his mind and put it in a space, you know, that he just, he would, he would uh, just over repeat in his mind, like, you know, uh, um, I don't know, just some sort of thing, a little thing, he just say over and over and over again, so that I wouldn't be able to catch him thinking about the thing he didn't want me to know, because I did tend to know things that they were thinking when they didn't say them. And uh, that was sometimes a problem for them. So they had to mask their thoughts occasionally to keep dad from being aware of what they were thinking. Um, but in other ways, it, it made it uh, um, real helpful. They tended to not have secrets. They tended to be very honest and straightforward with me about everything. They tended to share. I was close with all my kids, and uh, the relationship I had with my children was one of openness. And uh, they, they generally felt um, able to talk to me about anything going on in their life and what was happening. And, and uh, they wouldn't always take my advice, but they always had it in their mind that, that uh, maybe they, it would come in useful someday. So we were very, uh, very close. The idea that most parents in their teens don't really communicate well is I didn't have that problem. I communicated very well with my kids. I was the teacher in the homeschool. So we were, we spent a lot of hours together all day, every day we spent hours together. So, and, uh, they were, they were very happy hours. They were good hours. So that, uh, they had no problems with any of it, but do they do it? No, no, they, they don't practice it much. Both of my sons meditate, not regularly, probably not often. My younger son now has two children that are that are very young and a job that's very busy. So, you know, he doesn't have much time for doing other things, but keeping up with life. Um, but they are aware of meditation. They're aware of uh, larger reality. They're aware of all that stuff. Uh, they understand the nature of things and they just integrate all that into their life. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So has, has everyone asked their questions? You have. All right. Um, I'm going to go on with a question from the MBT forum from Issa Pika. And he explains that English is his second language. It seems like he's done a very good job, though. I'm going to go right to the question because all of these things are using, some of the explanations are using some of your metaphors of the IUOC, the Individuated Unit of Consciousness, and the Free Will Awareness Unit. His question is, here and now, I, the particular subset of the IUOC that is logged in on the data stream that I play now, is separated from the IUOC. So he's speaking about his Free Will Awareness Unit is separated from the IUOC. I mean, I am consciously aware of my particular environment, and the IOC is also conscious separately of the environment in MPMR. Both are conscious at the same time. When the avatar in which the partition that I am right now will die, boundaries will be taken down, and I will reintegrate my IUOC. Tom says that in that process, the IUOC, or the Free Will Awareness Unit, partition will disappear because I will reintegrate into the IUOC that has its own Free Will Awareness Unit. I think he's mixed up a couple of those. Anyway, 
what he is describing is that the free will awareness units partition will disappear and he will reintegrate into the um, individuated unit of consciousness. Then logically, should we consider that when the boundaries are taken down, I will lose the awareness I have of myself to the benefit of the free will awareness unit of my IUOC? I mean, is there a continuity of consciousness regarding the consciousness of the free will awareness unit partitioned? And I think he has done a fairly good job of explaining um, and asking why and how can I still be aware of myself in my free will, if my free will awareness unit disappears. Okay, I have, I'm looking at the written question that I have, <clears throat> but it differs mm -hmm. quite a bit from what you're reading. Oh, I see, okay. What I have is, uh, okay, here's my question. Here and now, I, mm -hmm. here and now, I, the particular subset of the IOC that is logged into this data stream and that I play now is separate from the main IOC, right? I mean, I am conscious of my particular environment, and the IOC is also conscious, separately, of his environment in the NPMR. Both are conscious at the same time, two consciousnesses. When the avatar in which the partition that I am right now will die, when the avatar in which the partition that I am right now will die, boundaries will be taken down and I will regenerate my IUOC, now reintegrate, yeah, reintegrate with my IUOC. But Tom says that in that process, the free will awareness, the FWAU partitioned will disappear because I will reintegrate the IUOC that has its own free will awareness unit. I'll have to say that again, that was kind of confusing. But Tom says that in that process, the free will awareness, the free will, the FWAU partitioned will disappear, true, because I will reintegrate with the IUOC that has its own free will awareness unit. That's the problem. The IUOC doesn't have its own free will awareness unit that it's just there all the time. That, that free will awareness unit is created within the IUOC. So the IUOC partitions off a piece of itself. It calls that the free will awareness unit. And that piece logs on to make the choices of an avatar. Okay, then when that avatar dies, that partition comes down. And that part that was called the free will awareness unit no longer exists. It's now just an IUOC. Okay. There is no partition anymore. Okay. So it says then logically, we sh should we consider that when the boundaries are taken down, I will lose the consciousness I have of myself to the benefit of the free will awareness unit of my own. I yeah, you're thinking that this free will awareness unit somehow always is a part of the IUOC. It's a, it's a permanent fixture in the IUOC, and it is not. It's only created in order to uh, log on to some avatar, and when that avatar dies, that free will awareness unit doesn't exist anymore. The partition is down. Maybe you don't understand partition in the terms of computer science. In computer science, if you have a computer, that computer can do multiple things at, at one time. And we call that partitioning. So the computer can partition off a piece of memory or partition off a piece of processor, particularly if you have a, a processor that is multi-cores. It can partition off a core. And that core and that memory can just go off and work a problem and can work on that problem, whereas other parts, other cores, and other pieces of memory can work on different problems. So you can have a big mainframe computer working on 10 or 20, 30 problems all at the same time. And it does that by partitioning off pieces of memory and pieces of processing that work those jobs. Now, this word partition often refers to memory. I'm using it kind of metaphorically here, but the partition means the computer just says, this piece of memory is gonna be used for this job. And that piece of memory is gonna be used for that job. 
And it may even have certain security criteria for different permissions. You have to log in to, to use this partition in my memory. You have to log on with a certain password. So that's just the way partitions are. And that partition can be taken down, can be removed. It's just a part of the larger computer. You can even think of ourselves. You can, all, you can even think of an individuated unit of consciousness as a, just a partitioned off piece of the larger consciousness system. So you have a larger conscious system and it partitions off a piece of itself, some of its processing, some of its memory, and creates a IUOC. So you might think of it that way. So we're just a partitioned off piece of the larger consciousness system. Anyway, so the free will awareness unit is just something that is a piece, a not a not a not a part of the IUOC. It's not a part of it in the sense that it's always there, but it's just created by taking a part of the IUOC and and taking some subset of the IUOC and just using that subset that we call a free will awareness unit. So the partition is a subset. All right. So when that partition comes down, there is no subset anymore. You just have a larger superset. Superset just, can, you know, absorbs that that subset of itself. Now it's just all back into the superset or the system that we're talking about, which is the IUOC is the system we're talking about. The final question at the bottom is, how can I still be aware of myself if my FWAU, my free will awareness unit, disappears? Well, your individuated unit of consciousness is aware of all the incarnations, aware of all the experience packets that you've ever had. That's its job to be aware. You know, that's, that's, its, that's its function. That's why I created an IUOC. It's the thing that is the cumulative awareness. It accumulates experience, all the experience that all of your various free will awareness units, all of the various incarnations, all belongs to the IUOC. It accumulates all of it. So your yourself basically disappears. You become just information in the IUOC of that particular incarnation. So you yourself, that free will awareness unit, is gone. There is no you yourself anymore. But you, as an IUOC, can be aware of the you yourself that you were. It's in the past tense, because it's got all that information. Every thought you ever thought, every feeling you ever had, everything you ever did, all the things you, you wanted to do but didn't, you know, it's all in there. Everything. So it can be aware of all of that, but it's all in the past tense. It's just aware of that, that that has happened. You... Your identity as a free will awareness unit doesn't go on. It's not immortal. It's only that identity as that particular individual is gone when that individual is gone. You, consciousness, the IUOC, that's who you really are. You're the IUOC. And a piece of yourself, a piece of that IUOC, goes off and has this adventure with this avatar. When that adventure is over, you have all that information, you have all that experience. You have all the experience that each avatar and all your incarnations have experienced because you are an IUOC. You're not the free will, or the free will awareness unit. You, fundamentally. And if you want to get more fundamental than that, we are just a part of the larger consciousness system. So we're a subset of the larger conscious system. We're an IUOC. Then we create a subset of ourselves to go play a game. The game's over, and we have all that experience. Because that free will awareness unit that played the game was us, was a piece of us. And that partition's taken down, and now we have... Uh, a different avatar, and that goes out and plays a game and gains experience and hopefully decreases its entropy. And now we come back, and now our entropy has been decreased. Our 
we, the IUOC, our entropy has been decreased by that free will awareness unit. You see, now we take a part of ourselves, make another free will awareness unit, it goes out, has experience, and hopefully our entropy will be reduced again. And that's how that goes. So you have to think of yourself as the IUOC. And a subset of yourself was what was answering or what was, was um, making all the choices. It was just you, but a subset of you that was dedicated just to that function because you wouldn't want to have been doing two or three things at once. That part of you that's going to make uh, choices for a, an, an entity has to be 100% involved in just that entity. So you, the IUOC, don't want to log on and make the choices because you have the memory of all those other lifetimes. You have memories of all sorts of other things. You've got other things going on in your head, things to do. And uh, that should not be a part of that, you know, logged on to that avatar. That's not a part of that avatar's life. You want just a subset of you that has no memory, just has quality, so that all the choices it makes are real. They're not made, oh, this is what I should do. You're not acting. You just, because you don't have any, mem any memory that takes your ability to act away from you. You have to just be who and what you are. You have that quality. And by the choices you make, then you evolve or de-evolve. So that's the way that works. So you, who you consider, you know, you're, the trouble is you're identifying with your avatar. You, Uncle Fred. You, you know, the avatar don't continue to exist. The avatar expires. The avatar is done. Uncle Fred is done. So when your life is done here, then that character retires. That character isn't played anymore. That character's done. You are immortal. You're an IUOC. You, Yoposia, are not immortal. You're just a character. One of many, one of thousands of characters that you have played. You, the IUOC. All right. Hopefully that'll answer the question. I think so. You often talk about the accumulated quality that the IUOC contains and those kinds of things when you go into another lifetime, things that allow you to um, experience what you experienced at six years old, depending on the kinds of experience you had. And then also those things that you learned that you dedicated your life to uh, perfecting in meditation and, and things like that. Those carry on. That is that right, Tom? Yeah. Well, all the quality that you earn carries on. You take that quality to your next, you know, to your next uh, avatar. Your avatar starts life with that level of quality. So it has the, um, you know, it's likely to make better decisions, but it can make poor decisions. It makes these choices based on the quality it comes in with. But it has to start without any experience. So it's ex the, all the experience that that free will awareness unit has is the experience that it's gained from being logged onto that avatar. So you begin to identify the, the, the free will awareness unit identifies itself as the avatar and the avatar identifies itself as a free will awareness unit. So those two are identified and people, of course, from uh, models other than, than my big toe have this idea that you personally, you, George, you, Uncle Fred, survive. You're immortal. Uncle Fred lives on. There's always going to be an Uncle Fred. The Uncle Fred persists forever and ever and ever. And the Uncle Fred goes to heaven and persists or goes to hell and persists. But the Uncle Fred always persists. He's always Uncle Fred. And that's not the case. The Uncle Fred is just an avatar. Avatars go. They don't continue on. You, the consciousness, the IUOC, continue on to have more and more avatars, more and more experience packets. You gain quality through iterative experiences. You learn from your mistakes. You don't have just one shot. One shot and that's it. You're going to be like that however you are after one lifetime. Well, 
that would be impossible for us to grow up and become love in one in one time. It's just too much to do, too hard to do. You have to have a lot of lifetimes. Uncle Fred's just one of those, you know, it was the avatar that you played. And when you're no longer playing that avatar, that avatar is gone. Uncle Fred doesn't continue on. His consciousness, the IUOC, that partitioned off the free will awareness unit that played Uncle Fred, that IUC, OUC, continues on. You see? So that's a problem. A lot of people have that problem because they want to continue on. They, you know, Joe Smith. Joe Smith wants to live forever and always be Joe Smith. He shouldn't want to live forever because Joe Smith is very limited. Joe Smith only has so much quality. Joe Smith is full of fear, full of beliefs, full of ego. And if Joe Smith would like to stay that way forever, that's not smart. Joe, you need to let that go. You know, it's, uh, it's just not the way you want to be forever. You want to continue to grow up and continue to evolve as a person. And in order to do that, you need to have multiple lifetimes. And you need to be Joe Smith and, and Susie Wang and, and, you know, Sally uh, Jones. And you need to be all sorts of people, all sorts of races, different sexes. You need to be, you know, you need to have a very wide grasp of experience in order to grow up and become love. You can't do that just by being Joe. You got to, you know, and if that you want Joe to live forever, that would be sad because Joe is a very limited being. And Joe uh, isn't something you want to live forever. Joe is just a step in a forward direction. So Joe's gone when he dies. Joe's gone. Now you're somebody else. And then after that, you're somebody else. And after that, you're somebody else. And when you're done with all of those, those characters are done. But they're all you, and they're all a part of you. And you have all of their lives and all of their experience all reside in the, in the IUOC, Individuated Unit of Consciousness. They all reside in there. So they're not, they're not done in the sense that they just disappear. All of their experiences that they had are all part of that IUOC. Well, Tom, a necessary part of your My Big Toe theory is multiple life experience packets because it is an efficient system in evolution. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah, I didn't put in, uh, um, I didn't call it reincarnation. I just said life experience packets because you need a lot of experience to grow up. And one experience packet one lifetime is not enough time to evolve the quality of your consciousness. It's not about acting. You could learn in one lifetime how to act nice, perhaps. But in one lifetime, you're not going to learn to be nice. You can just learn to act. It takes many, many lifetimes to change who you are. You're changing the fundamental substance, the fundamental value of yourself. That is not done, can't be done in a lifetime. So reincarnation came into my model or experience packets came into my model because it was absolutely essential for the evolution of consciousness. Otherwise, consciousness is stuck. It can't evolve. You know, it doesn't, you know, evolution is a, evolution is really blocked if you can't go on. And each character is a one-off. Each lifetime is a one-off. It doesn't continue. I think this can be very helpful for people to understand that this rich diversity of experience um, in different races, in different uh, cultures, and um, different genders is important um, in the sense that I think they could see a bigger picture of why we need to be more tolerant and more cooperative. Sure. That's all important. Diversity is extremely important for growing up and seeing big pictures. Yeah, it's, you know, it used to be a long time ago, people never got more than about 20 miles from where they were born because 20 miles is a long way to walk. 
And they were called provincial because they did not have a big picture. They had a tiny little picture. And the people who traveled and had a lot of diverse experience, you know, had much bigger pictures of reality. Well, it's the same way. You know, diversity is important to, to big pictures. You don't get big pictures by just having the same limited information over and over again. You have to have a lot of diversity in your experience or, or big pictures just don't develop. So it's, it's essential. The problem is that people identify with their avatar. Yeah. They don't see themselves as an IUOC. They see themselves as Joe. They see themselves as, you know, their avatar. Well, that's the mistake. And when they see themselves as avatars, then they get very upset and unhappy that that avatar doesn't continue forever. But that avatar is just an avatar. It's nothing. It's a, it's a pretty picture on the screen of your computer. That avatar is just a virtual image in this game. It's a data stream. It doesn't really exist. What exists is consciousness. What's fundamental is consciousness. What exists is an IUOC, an individuated unit of consciousness. That's real and exists. Your avatar is just digital picture. So identification with your avatar is a mistake. You need to identify with your IUOC. And now, if you say, oh, I'm an IUOC, then I am immortal. You are. And you have a lot of varied experience, which helps you grow up. You're not limited to just one avatar's worth of experience. Thank you, Tom. So make those good choices. It, it all adds up. Tom Campbell here. I and MBT Events hope you liked this video. We now have well over a thousand hours of free video on this user-friendly, ad-free YouTube channel. Though these videos are free to our viewers, they represent many thousands of hours in production and editing, and many thousands of dollars invested in video and audio equipment, along with the required computers and software to store and process the raw video into finished products. So far, all of this content has been funded directly out of our own pockets. Be assured, we will always continue to do what we can. It's our life, our purpose, a labor of love that we will continue to pursue as best we can. However, those pockets are not as deep as they used to be. Thus, we are now seeking to augment our resources with support from our viewers. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our Patreon account or through a one-time donation. The links are in the description below. Thank you.